this is yours. There you go. Okay. So we're going to. Is it? There we go. Okay. All right. We are looking at tonight, continuing our study of chasing the shadow of Jesus in the Old Testament. And uh, so far we have looked at and we have talked about Jesus and his relationship with the Old Testament statements that he made and what they implied and how we should understand them. Uh, we looked at his family line, tracing that. And tonight we're going to look at his identity or his, his deity. Uh, for a number of years in studying the New Testament, uh, I was often kind of perplexed as to why the Jews of the first century to the claims of Jesus being God. Uh, and at first I just kind of thought, well, maybe it's just the typical things that, that he doesn't fit their idea of who the Messiah should be. And so <clears throat> that's why it is that, that they're not accepting this claim for him to be God. Or maybe it's, um, he, you know, he just didn't fit their mold for what it is that they wanted, uh, that he want, that they wanted him to be. But then that kind of led me to thinking along this line, was there something in the Old Testament that hinted at or at least gave us the idea that the Messiah was going to be God? And, you know, as I started to ask myself that question, I started to think, well, maybe if I don't know the answer to that, maybe I should be a little bit slower to criticize them for not being able to accept that either. Because when you go through the Old Testament, the, the idea, the, well, not just the idea, the truth of the fact is that it's there. It's there in not just a ton of passages, such as, say, the discussion of his crucifixion, his death for the sins of the world are going to be pretty common, whether in images or in direct prophecies. But the idea that the Messiah of the Old Testament would be God is found in the Old Testament. And <clears throat> Jesus will actually cite some of those texts in his own public ministry in order uh, to make that point. And so what I want us to do tonight is something very simple. I want us to begin in John chapter 5. <clears throat> And look at the claims of Jesus, just three of them in John, and, and the reaction, which is the same in every one of them. And then I want us to look at five Old Testament texts that give us something and help us to understand it and showed us that the Messiah would be indeed deity or divine. Okay. So as we begin in John chapter 5, as we watch the claims of Jesus come forward. Well, if I turn that on. We'll get it all together at some point tonight. So in John chapter 5, this is after Jesus has healed the man uh, earlier in the chapter. It says, beginning in verse 16, And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. And so when he calls him my father, he's making there a claim of his own divinity, which is actually explained by their reaction in verse 18, it says, This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, which was the idea of healing on the Sabbath day, but he was calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. And so you see the reaction is Jesus claims to be God, even through something as simple as saying, My Father, and then the reaction is they try all the more to kill him because, in their minds, of course, that's blasphemy. If anybody else other than Jesus would have made that claim, that would have been a cause for death under the old law because it would have been blasphemy. All right? Now fast forward to the end of John chapter 8 <clears throat> as he is having a discussion in the temple area with the Jewish leaders. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 56, it says this, Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it. And was glad. Now that either has reference to the promise made in Genesis 12 or perhaps even Genesis chapter 22 with uh, the events on Mount Moriah. And so he says, he saw it and was glad. So the Jews said, You're not, you are not yet 50 years old and have you seen Abraham? Abraham's been dead well over a thousand years at this point. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. I am tying himself back to the Exodus 3 and verse 14 revelation of God in the burning bush to Moses. 
And so he's calling himself God. He's claiming to be the I am of the burning bush. And then you see their reaction. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. All right, quickly over in John chapter 10, there's a very similar instance. <clears throat> in John chapter 10, beginning in verse 29, it says, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father, I and the Father are one. That is one in substance, one in nature, one in essence. We're both God, is what he's saying. And so he's making a claim to be God. And then you see the reaction of the Jews, verse 31. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. And so you see the claim of Jesus, which again is a very audacious claim unless it's true. If he really is, and he's the only one who could have ever made that claim. And so it's a heavy claim for someone to say, I'm God. Unless you are God himself, which is who Jesus was. And so you can understand being taken back by, the, by hearing that from what you perceive to be simply another human being. And so they reacted very quickly in order with the law, which was individuals guilty of blasphemy were to be killed. Especially, you remember, uh, on many occasions in the Old Testament, <clears throat> rising up against and, and speaking blasphemies against God... Uh, a foreigner was known to blaspheme God in the midst of the children of Israel, and he was killed for that. And so, <clears throat> you see that strong reaction. But here's the thing, and this is what we have to consider. What was it that they missed? Because they seemed not only to be hostile to Jesus because he didn't fit their mold, but also hostile to Jesus because of his claim to be God. And so it causes you to wonder, what, what was it in the Old Testament that they missed that they did not make the connection between Messiah, the coming one, and God? That the Messiah would be God? Because there were many connections that they failed to see. I've often wondered, you remember on the cross when the, uh, Matthew says that when the Jews passed by, they wagged their heads at him, and they said, if you're the Son of God, come down and save yourself, and so forth. And when you study Psalm 22, it's been predicted that that's going to happen. I've often sat, as I've wondered, reading that text, did it ever dawn on them that they were saying the very words of Scripture that they knew? And so it's very easy, but again, I'm slow to be, <clears throat> certainly they're held responsible for their rejection of Jesus. I'm not making light of that. But I also know my own tendencies to be dense. And to not pay attention. And to miss things that are there. And so, <clears throat> that, le that leads us then to this look at the Old Testament. Where are these statements that would combine the ideas of Messiah and God and that they be the same being? So let's begin in Psalm 45. Psalm 45. <clears throat> Here's the content of the scriptures and what they have to say about Jesus being or the Messiah being. God. Now, Psalm 45 <clears throat> is a psalm that is what we call a wedding psalm. Okay? When you read it, it shows the idea of a wedding taking place. In the first part of the psalm, it's addressing the groom. In the second part of the psalm, it's, dressing, it's addressing the bride. And there's obviously, uh, at least on the front of it, kingly elements to it, if not divine elements to it, which we will see. Okay? <clears throat> so, as he the psalmist is addressing the groom, beginning in verse 2. He says, You are the most handsome of the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one, and in your splendor and your majesty. In your majesty, ride out victoriously for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Let your right hand teach you awesome deeds. Your arrows are sharp. In the heart of the king's enemies and peoples fall under you. Now pay close attention to these verses. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of, righteous, of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of, of gladness beyond your companions. Now, here's the first time we're getting a hint when we start paying attention to the words of the psalm. 
Now, you have to remember the Psalms are actually five books. And more modern translations will show you when one book ends and a new book begins. It will say book one at the very top. Say, um, I want to say the first division is somewhere in the 40s. <clears throat> um, matter of fact, I can check real quick since we're there. Yes, book two begins in Psalm 42. And so you have five different books, and they're combined together. And this was their song book. And so they were very familiar with the words the same way you and I are. We could sing the majority of the songs we sing at church without ever looking at a book. We know what they say. Or we just kind of know them by repetition. And so you can, that may be something, I just kind of dawned on me, that may be one of the reasons why they didn't catch the connection. Because sometimes we sing songs and we don't catch the connection. We've sung them our whole lives. Okay? Um, just to, to show you how dense I can be, it took me years to realize that it was farther along and not farther along. I don't know why that was. I didn't catch the connection, but it made a whole lot more sense when I actually read it. I didn't understand why we were saying father along. I mean, that didn't make grammatical sense to me, but, you know, whatever. But, so we have that tendency not to pay attention. And so here he is, and in the psalm he's addressing a groom. And it, it's normal royal address in the first parts. But then you come to verse 6 and he says, Your throne, O God. But he's still talking to the groom. And he's calling him God. He's not turning his attention to heaven. He's talking to the same man. He says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Your reign is eternal. And the scepter, which was carried by kings, the scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. And this, by the way, plays into what we're studying in First and Second Kings. You see, the ones who carried the scepter in First and Second Kings, they didn't carry the scepter in uprightness. And that's why we needed a king who would carry the scepter in uprightness. And so, it's a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Now, notice this. This is when it gets more complex. Because in 6, it begins, your throne, O God. And then, he says, therefore, God, your God. And so he calls the bridegroom God, and then he says, God, your God has said this to you. So what's the connection here? You've got one member of the Godhead as we know it. That's a term used in the King James New Testament. Speaking to another member of the Godhead. So you have what here, a fa you have the Father speaking to the Son. Now... <clears throat> That interpretation is upheld for us in the New Testament. Because in Hebrews chapter 1, when the writer is showing the superiority of Jesus to angels, he says, to, and to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And he quotes this verse word for word. And so there it is, in Psalm 45, there's the idea, there's the connection. And Jews understood Psalm 45, they saw, and when you look at their writings, they saw there was a connection between Psalm 45 and the Messiah. But for some reason, the connection that the Messiah would also be God was something that escaped them. But the text is showing us, it's right there in front of us in the text. But do you see how easy it is to read it over very quickly and say, The arrows are sharp in the heart of the kings and enemies, and the people fall under your throne. O oh God, is forever and ever. Your robes are all fragrant myrrh and myrrh. And so when you read quickly, instead of paying very close attention, and you ask yourself, now wait a minute. Now in my Bible, verse 5 is at the very end of this page, and then you have to turn at the top of the page. It says, Your throne, O oh God, is forever and ever. And so when you're going alone, you kind of have to stop and go, now wait a minute, what in the world just happened? Because we're talking to a kingly leader, and now all of a sudden that kingly leader is called God, and then we're seeing all this, expense, all this language poured upon that. So there's that connection that exists, and the writer of Hebrews makes that connection for us as well in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. <clears throat> so... Another parallel and similar situation is Psalm 110. 
Psalm 110, it is pretty close to, if not the most quoted psalm in the New Testament. And this psalm carries with it a lot of messianic ideas. I call it the dual office psalm. And it, it shows us that there's something special or peculiar about this individual. Now here's why. Because in verse 1, we're told that the individual being spoken of is going to be a king. Okay? The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So you've got a king, you've got a ruler. And then in verse 4, he says, The Lord has sworn forever that you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And so what you have in the context is you have God's promise of a king and a priest talking about the same individual. Now, what's, why should that cause us to stop and think? Because under the old law, it was impossible for you to be both. Kings, especially in Judah, in the southern tribes, came from Judah. Priests came from the tribe of Levi. Those two offices could never be together. And that's why in Hebrews 7, when the writer there is making the argument about the superiority of the priesthood of Jesus, he's saying it's not according to the old order because our Lord sprang from Judah. He couldn't be a priest in the old order. He's not from the right tribe. And so, just a cursory reading of it, we get the idea that there's something much bigger that's going on in this particular context. So, <clears throat> then he says this. Let's look more closely at verse 1. The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now, we'll come back to the Lord says to my Lord in just a minute. And talk about that because that's very similar to what is done in Psalm 45. But then he says, sit at my right hand, a place of position and honor. The right hand is always there. Until I have made your enemies, your footstool, an old custom. Joshua 10 and verse 24. When you conquered kings, you would come and you would even symbolically step on their throats. The idea was that you had submitted them, you had conquered, you had conquered them, and so they were thus under your feet. Joshua has the people do that in Joshua chapter 10 and verse 24. <clears throat> now, he says, the Lord said to my Lord. Now, Jesus, this actually is going to be quoted quite a bit in the New Testament. Jesus uses it in Matthew 22. Peter uses it in Acts chapter 2, verses 34 and 35. Hebrews 1 quotes it again in Hebrews 1 and verse 13. So what does he mean here? Because this is actually the psalm that Jesus alludes to in a discussion with the religious leaders in the temple in the last week of his life on earth. When he asked them the question, he said, the Messiah, the Christ, whose son is he? Whose son is he? Where does he descend from? Their answer? He's the son of David. Well, that was the right answer. But Jesus then asked this question. Okay. He says, David said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now, if the Messiah is the son of David, then how does the Messiah call him Lord? How does David call him Lord? So what's the point that he's making? When he says, the Lord said to my Lord, David is writing the psalm. David is the author of Psalm 110. So David is the supreme king in Israel. There's no one above him, right? There's no human being above him. But he, yet he says he has a Lord. He says, the Lord, which we would connect with God, right? Said to my Lord. Now we're left a little bit confused, right? There's no human being above him. We know God is above him. That makes sense. But now why is he saying the Lord is saying to my Lord, who is this second individual that's above David? What you have is what he's saying is, the Lord, God the Father, said to my Lord, God the Son, the Messiah, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. There is the statement about the divinity of the Messiah. That he's God. That the one who is coming, <clears throat> who will reign, not only as king, but also as priest, 
He's God. And so there you see that connection between the one who is coming and the fact that he is divine. Okay? Now, <clears throat> number three, let's fast forward to Isaiah. And we'll look at a couple here together very closely uh, related to one another and close in proximity as well. In Isaiah chapter 7, there's an invasion coming <clears throat> on the people of Israel. And God sends to the king at the time Ahaz and tells him to ask for a sign. Now it's kind of peculiar because sometimes God says, <clears throat> you're asking for a sign, you're showing unbelief. But on this occasion, when God tells you, ask of me a sign, that's not a time when you say, no, I don't need one. If he's telling you to ask for it, you ask for it. Ahaz refuses to ask for it. And so God said, okay, I'm going to give you a sign myself. Verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And Emmanuel literally means God with us. So, <clears throat> and there, there are a lot of surrounding elements and discussions that we can have about Isaiah 7. But the one I want to focus in on is the name that is chosen. Because he's saying there's coming someone who's going to be called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So what is the connection? Well, isn't this the prophecy that's used to describe to Joseph, the husband of Mary, how she has conceived a child but yet has not been unfaithful to him? You see, sometimes we look at the... At the the story of the conception of Jesus and the birth of Jesus, and we think, oh, what a, what a beautiful story. No controversy, right? We, we, we look at it with rose glasses. No, listen, the conception of Jesus was surrounded by controversy. She went away to visit Elizabeth, and she was, at that time, with child, not knowing it. No one else knew it. She wasn't showing. She comes back a few months later, and she's showing she hasn't been with Joseph. He's been back where he belongs, doing his job, and she's been over here with Elizabeth. So what's the idea? She must have found someone where she went to visit, and now she's become pregnant out of wedlock. The virgin birth of Jesus was surrounded with controversy. And that's why the angel has to appear to Joseph in Matthew 1 saying, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because that thing which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And this is that it might be fulfilled, which was written by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. What is, what is the angel assuring Joseph of? Mary has not been unfaithful to you. She is a part of a fulfillment of a promise of God more than 700 years ago that you and all of Israel have been waiting for. But the very fact that he's called Emmanuel, that God will be with us. Not just in a metaphorical, metaphorical is not the best term. Not just in a sense that God is always with us. But the fact that he's literally going to be amongst us. That's the idea. That the one who is coming that's going to be among us, with us. Think of it as a circle. Here we are, and there's one coming into that circle, and the one coming into that circle is going to be God. He's literally going to be with us. And so there is the concept of the one who is coming into the world is God to live amongst us. And so a Messiah <clears throat> is also God. All right, look at chapter 9, where we see some of the titles given as to who this son would be, because this idea of 714 goes through chapters 8 and 9 and flows over. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. He says, For unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given. Which, obviously, when you look at the language of 714, it sounds familiar. But also, when you look at the announcement of the birth of Jesus, Luke chapter 2, he uses the same language. For unto us... Or unto you this day in the city of David is born one, Christ the Savior. And he says, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, as he'll bear its responsibility. 
And his name shall be called, four names, Wonderful Counselor, depending upon translations, there's disagreement about whether or not Wonderful Counselor is one title or two. Probably the best idea is that it's one. Wonderful Counselor, a Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, every one of those <clears throat> titles are important and they show us something. But there are two in particular that just in reading them, don't they give you the idea? That the Messiah, this one spoken of, is more than just a mere human being. What are they? Mighty God, everlasting Father, eternal Father. And so the one who is coming is going to be a wonderful counselor. Wonderful in the sense that his works will incite wonder in people. Counselor, his counsel, his message. And, and that title, Wonderful Counselor, is seen very well in Mark 1, 21 to 28, when he's speaking in the synagogue and people are held in wonder at the way in which he is able to speak and explain Scripture. But then you remember a demon-possessed man is also in that synagogue and Jesus casts out the demon and they say, what kind of man is this? So you see, they look at his counsel, his teaching, they listen to his teaching, but they also see his miracles and they behold in wonder. Wonderful counselor. Mighty God. His might was exhibited all throughout his ministry, not just in his miracles, but especially in his miracles. Mighty God, everlasting Father. Now this is the one text of the five that we're going to look at. We've already looked, this is the fourth one. This is the one text of the five that there isn't really a direct citation in the New Testament. What do we mean by that? No New Testament writer takes this text and says, therefore the writing of Isaiah is fulfilled, which said, he shall be called, so forth. But it is captured, the idea of it is captured all throughout the New Testament. And there are other texts like Mary's Magnificat in Luke chapter 1 and in other places where we see all of these truths are speaking of Jesus. Or the Prince of Peace, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14. He created peace. We have peace with God, Romans 5 and verse 1. I mean, the, the, the tie-ins are endless. And so we see the idea of the Messiah being God in the flesh. Now again, to us, that seems elementary and fundamental. Because you and I, one of the ways we're able to come to saving faith is what? We have to acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God. But you have to remember this. They're in, the, they're in the midst of progressive revelation. What do I mean by that? Progressive revelation. That is God was still speaking and revealing things. You and I live in a time of closed revelation. That is God has said all he will say. There's no new book. There's no new word from the Lord that is to come to us. We have it all. And so for us, some of, those, some of the things that <clears throat> they struggled with, it's a little harder for us to understand because we see it. We live on this side of completed revelation. It's very similar to 1 Peter chapter 1 when he said, The prophets wrote of the Christ who was coming to you. And they searched and they inquired diligently concerning the things that they were writing. What did he mean? He means that even the prophets who uttered these words about the coming Messiah didn't even fully understand them themselves. When they were writing it through inspiration, they were thinking to themselves, I wonder what this means. I wonder what this means. I wonder how this is going to play out. Which is why, even further, Jesus would say in Matthew 13 to the disciples, Many prophets and righteous men have longed to see what you see and have not seen it. They have longed to hear what you hear, and they have not heard it, because they wrote of these things, and yet they didn't understand them. But you're getting to watch them take place in front of your very eyes. And we get to look back over the whole of what God has said, and we can tie every single thing together. So, number five, <clears throat> Micah chapter five and verse two, and I'm a little behind on the PowerPoint, I think. We're looking at the birth of Jesus. Micah <clears throat> chapter 5, 
Micah is one of those smaller, minor prophets. If you go, if you can find Jonah, Micah is just a page over. <clears throat> now, Micah is actually, Micah preaches around 735 B.C. or so. He is a contemporary with Isaiah. Isaiah started in about 755, so he's a little bit older, and he's preaching in the city. He's got access to the courts. He has international influence but he's preaching inside of Jerusalem. Micah is a younger prophet, and he preaches more on the outskirts of Jerusalem, some of those villages. At the time that Isaiah and Micah are preaching in the south, Hosea and Amos are preaching in the north. And so you've actually, some of these books, you look, when you're just reading through them, you think, okay, this one did his work, and this one did his work, and then this one. Overlapping each other. And so Micah and Isaiah are contemporaries. And so Micah is looking, in chapter 4, Micah has made a wonderful prophecy, very similar to Isaiah's. Most people are familiar with Isaiah's version of this, but listen to Micah in chapter 4. It'll come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established at the highest of the mountains, and it shall be lifted up above the hills, and people shall flow to it, and many nations shall come and say, Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, and to the house of, God, of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us of his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Isn't that almost word for word from Isaiah 2, 2 and 3? Okay. Micah, you've got two prophets that are working as contemporaries, he and Isaiah. Both of them have a word from the Lord. It's not surprising that they're going to say similar things. Okay. And so in that flow of thought... <clears throat> We then come to chapter 5. This chapter 4 goes on and talks about God rescuing Zion spiritually and physically and things along that line. And then we come to verse 2 of chapter 5. He says, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth to, for me one who is to be a ruler in Israel, whose, go, whose coming forth is from old and from ancient of day and from ancient days. So let's take a look at what he's saying here. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah. Ephrathah just means fruitfulness. Now he's separating Bethlehems because there's more than one Bethlehem. Okay, that's not uncommon, right? There are a lot of cities in our nation with the same, same name. Different states, same name. Okay, so you have a Bethlehem Joshua chapter 19 and verse 15, you have a Bethlehem that was also in the tribe of Zebulun, which was much further north. And then you have Bethlehem in Judah, where our Lord was born, which is spoken of here. So Bethlehem Ephrathah. <clears throat> now you're a little tribe, and from you shall come forth to me one who is to be a ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from of old, from ancient days, is what the ESV says. But what do other translations like the New American Standard and the New King James, how do they render it? Because it's a little more clear, isn't it? Something along the lines of the age of eternity? The eternal ages? And so what do you have? <clears throat> you have a prophecy that Messiah is coming, and this Messiah who is coming, by the way, oh, he's been in existence long before we ever meet him. You see, the one that's going to rule my people, Israel, he's not going to be one who was born like David. He did not exist, and then he existed. He was conceived, and then God gave him a soul, and he came into existence, and he ruled the people of God. This is one who did not come from normal conception. He did not exist, and then he existed. This is one whose going forth have been from the age of eternity. They're eternal. The one I'm speaking of is eternal. And the only one who can fit that bill is who? It has to be God. No other being is eternal. And this is something the Jews understood this text. They understood that this was talking about the Messiah because you remember in Matthew chapter 2 when Jesus is born and the wise men come and they want to worship Jesus. We've heard of the king who has been born. And Herod goes into a frenzy. Because Herod was 
power hungry and always felt threatened. He killed his kids. He killed his wives. Now, he was nice about it. He, named, he, built a, he, he would build a tower and then name it after them, but he still killed them. Okay? Crazy man. Um, <clears throat> and so he hears that this Messiah has been born, and he calls for the Jewish scholars and says, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? And they said, well, in the prophet Micah, it says in Bethlehem of Ephrathah. And they quote Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. But what's interesting is, and even in Matthew's giving of this account is, this last part of the tag is not attached to that verse as he shows it in Matthew 2. And so it's amazing that they were able to get the idea the Messiah would come and be born in the city of Bethlehem, but yet miss that that Messiah was also one who was eternal, which made him, he had to be God. And so, <clears throat> when we're looking at the Old Testament, and we're looking at the Messiah, we're looking at the one who is coming. What we're able to piece together, obviously, is that the one who is coming is going to be God. God is coming into the world, and apparently he's coming into the world in human form. Okay? And that's Hebrews 10 and some other psalms that are quoted, a body you've prepared for me. <clears throat> so he's coming into the world, and he's going to live and be with us, amongst us. You see, that's not something... That's just a New Testament concept. Or a New Testament teaching. That was something that God had been saying all along. And so then that leads us to think about ourselves in light of this. Then, as they were living, and listen, I'm not in any way excusing their rejection of Jesus. Okay? There's no excusing that. The evidence was there before them. God will not go lighter on Matter of fact, there are instances in the New Testament where it seems like actually God holds them more accountable because they saw him and they didn't realize who he was. But we go back to this concept of They were in progressive revelation. God was still speaking. He had been silent for about 400 years before John the Baptist comes on the scene. There had not been a prophet since, then, since uh, the prophet Malachi. He was the last one to speak. And then John the Baptist comes on the scene, and then you have Jesus coming on the scene. And they missed him. They missed him. They, re they balked at the concept that their Messiah would be God. But then you come down and you, and, and you make this a little bit more personal to us. Let me ask you something. What is the difference between us and them if we make this mistake? Because there are a lot of people who are willing to accept that Jesus is the Son of God, that He is God. We are willing to make that intellectual acceptance and assent. But yet, if that doesn't translate into a changed life, what difference does it make? If that doesn't translate into changing who we are, then are we really any different than the people who refuse to accept him as the Son of God? We, you see, sometimes we can make ourselves feel better by saying, oh, I at least accept and acknowledge he's the Son of God. But you've got to understand something. God doesn't see it that way. Because in God's eyes, there's no difference between the person who looks at the evidence and says, no, nope, not there. And the person who looks at the evidence and says, yes, but I'm not going to change. Both of them are guilty of rejecting his son. And so when we understand and when we say, and when a person before they're baptized into Christ, they stand up in front of people and they're asked the question, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God? They're affirming Old Testament and New Testament assessments 
of who Jesus is. And the word for confess means to say the same thing as another, to agree with. And so we're agreeing with God's assessment of His Son when we confess Jesus as the Son of God. But that confession can't just be in words. And that's why the book of Hebrews will talk to them about what? Holding fast to our confession. Because confession was more than just the words that they had pronounced. It was also the life of faithfulness that followed. And so, as I look at them, and as I look at their rejection of Jesus the Messiah, it's easy to get puffed up until you turn the mirror around and realize that you might just be guilty of the same thing. And so the question for us tonight is, what are we going to do with Jesus? The evidence is there. The, the, the claims, the teaching is consistent throughout the revelation of God in both Old and New Testaments, that He's the Son of God. And if He is the Son of God, if He is God, He has the right to control everything about our lives. He has the right to dictate everything about our lives. I was reading a book a few years ago, probably four or five now, and in one of the chapters, it's a book that deals with <clears throat> apologetics. Uh, the, the man preaches in a very secular major city in the United States. And it's not an evidences book in the sense of... <clears throat> the basic arguments for the existence of God, You've, where you have the teleological argument, the ontological argument, so forth. You're looking at all these evidences. This is a book <clears throat> that deals more with, here's a word that's not used very, but it, it's epistemological. And what epistemology is, is the study of thinking right and the study of understanding truth. And in this book, he talks about a conversation that took place between two men, one of which he was talking to God about, and this man was having a conversation with his friend from communist, atheistic China. They were studying together in a university. And so they got in this conversation about the conversation this man was having with this particular preacher. And he said to his friend, I cannot accept God, I cannot accept this about God, and I cannot accept this about God, and I cannot accept that He tells me that I have to do this, and that I have to do this, and that I have to do this. And his friend from communist, atheistic China said, if He is God, which I don't believe in God, but if He is God, He does have the right to tell you every single thing you can and cannot do. Isn't it amazing that it takes quasi-religious people or people who are flirting with religion to distort something so simple? And a person who has no acceptance of God whatsoever can see it as plain as the nose on his own face. That to call God God means to give him control of everything. And tonight, if someone is willing to do that, <clears throat> to come to him and believe and repent of their sins, to revolutionize and change who they are, or to allow God to do that, and to confess that Jesus is the Son of God and to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of their sins, they begin that walk with Jesus. Or maybe as New Testament Christians... <clears throat> We haven't lived in a way that's consistent with our confession. We haven't lived in a way consistent with what we're saying when we say, yes, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Our lives don't match the words that come out of our mouths. That's a problem. And maybe we need to make that right. Maybe we need to talk about it and study it together. Whatever it is, we want to make sure that it's the right answer. If we can help you do that tonight, let us know as we stand and sing this song. <clears throat> Would you be 
free from the burden.